Hi everyone, thanks for uh, clicking on uh, the link to this talk. I'm here to talk about Dynabench rethinking benchmarking in NLP. Um, so yeah, we're talking about benchmarks and if you look at benchmarks uh, in recent years in NLP, you might be fooled into thinking that we have solved NLP. So what you can see here are things like squad um, and glue being saturated very quickly, uh, especially when you compare this to the long history of uh, benchmarks like MNIST and switchboard. So have we solved NLP? Um, I think you might argue that we've solved the average case uh, in the IID setting, the head of the distribution, uh, clean data, um, that sort of stuff. But I don't think anyone really would claim that we've really uh, uh, solved uh, language understanding at all. So what we should really be focusing on now is uh, the worst case or the tail of the distribution. So everything that is outside of the, the easy stuff that we're now reasonably able to do. And this really matters because NLP models are uh, these days being deployed with real world consequences. So they're uh, not uh, academic discussions anymore. Uh, these models are actually being deployed. So we have to be very careful with how we select models for deployment. And of course, benchmarks play a crucial role in that discussion. Uh, another issue is that people anthropomorphize machines and they're actually very bad at predicting when models will fail. Uh, so we shouldn't expect people to correct for the weaknesses that we have in our systems. We should fix the weaknesses in our systems so that people can interact with them uh, cleanly. Uh, and finally, true language understanding, uh, as I said in a previous slide, is about strong generalization. So that means that you should be able to generalize beyond uh, the average case IID uh, data set that you have because you have things like compositionality uh, that should get you all the way to much stronger generalization and that's one of the crucial characteristics of language. Um, so uh, Dynabench is a research platform for rethinking benchmarking. So the, the, uh, right now is a good, good moment uh, to start rethinking benchmarking because we've made a lot of good progress, but we have to think about how we make the next uh, set of steps uh, on our uh, journey towards uh, uh, solving or at least uh, uh, improving natural language understanding. So uh, the research platform is trying to challenge uh, some of the existing notions that we have uh, so to see if we can make better progress. And there are some crucial ideas here, uh, as the name suggests, uh, where we like to move beyond static things. So static data sets, static leaderboards, static metrics uh, towards a more dynamic future, if you will. And uh, a crucial question there is what happens when we collect data with humans and models in the loop. So that's another way of uh, saying that it's dynamic. So rather than having this static data collection, you actually have a model in the loop. And if we have these models in the loop and we can evaluate them uh, using humans in the loop, uh, uh, can we then also evaluate them on uh, multiple axes? So rather than just focus on accuracy, for example, can we think about the total utility uh, of a model and take a, a much more holistic approach? And hopefully in the process of doing all of this stuff, uh, we will collect useful data that will help us improve all of our systems. Um, and so uh, this is a, a very ambitious effort uh, that is a, a community effort, uh, including uh, with task owners from academia. And uh, we hope to keep growing this community. And we're uh, very ambitious because we're trying to solve uh, many well-known problems that currently exist in benchmarking. So these are things like saturation, where we achieve human level performance on benchmarks without actually having solved the real underlying problem. So things like glue and super glue have been solved now, but everyone knows that we haven't solved natural language understanding. So something is clearly going wrong there. And whenever saturation happens, we lose valuable time as a field because we have to figure out what the next set of benchmarks is going to look like. Then there are things like bias, so inadvertent annotator artifacts. Uh, and even other biases uh, like uh, just, um, uh, you know, uh, around construction, for example, that make benchmark too, benchmarks too easy, uh, which again makes it look like we are further than we actually are. Um, alignment, so benchmarks don't necessarily measure the right thing. Uh, I think one of the things that we really care about is not test set performance on a fixed test set, uh, but what we really want to measure is how well would the system work in the real world. Uh, so that's a very different alignment question uh, when you actually expose this to real humans rather than just to a static test set. Uh, leaderboard culture is very prevalent in a community uh, where the community is, is way too uh, focused on the rank on the leaderboard, uh, which uh, is actually pretty arbitrary when you think about it. Um, and uh, instead, the community uh, would be much better off if it focused on creative solutions to this problem uh, that we're trying to solve.
Then there's reproducibility issues, so people self-report results, which often can't be trusted. There's accessibility, so models that people have, they don't actually release those models or they're not easily accessible uh, either to the community or, or uh, let alone to lay people who don't know how to deploy these models. Ideally, if we want people to really understand what AI is about, then we also want to make our models accessible to anyone. Uh, finally, backward compatibility and utility. Uh, so uh, we want our, uh, when a new benchmark comes out, we want to be able to reevaluate old models to see how well they do on the new data. Um, and we want to make sure that we capture the fact that not everyone cares about the same thing. So if you're an IoT engineer, you care about efficiency much more than if you are an academic researcher and you don't really care about efficiency all that much. Uh, you just care about accuracy, for example. And then there are things like fairness and robustness, which are absolutely crucial when you deploy these systems in the wild, which maybe some people care more or less about, depending on uh, your personal situation, for example. Um, so these are all the problems we're trying to solve, and, and we're not claiming to have the solution here. Uh, I, I think, or we think that nobody really knows what the solution is to this yet, um, but that's why the problem is dynamic and it will keep evolving. Uh, as we make progress as a field. So we, we think we have some parts of the solution. So these are things like supporting multiple tasks over multiple rounds of data collection, uh, turning this into a, a broad community effort with ta task ex experts uh, who are the owners of these tasks who are really calling the shots about what happens in the task, then doing dynamic data collection with models in the loop um, and having dynamic leaderboards that rely on evaluation as a service um, and so in the rest of the talk, I'll just go over some of these crucial components to give you an idea of what the platform is about. Um, and then hopefully uh, in the live discussion, we can also uh, talk about this more if people have questions. Um, so the starting point uh, for the platform actually was this adversarial NLI data set that we created a few years ago, uh, which uh, uh, introduced among other papers. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so it was one of the, the first ones to uh, at a large scale, uh, apply this human and model in the loop data collection idea. So how this works is you have this writer uh, here. So this is for natural language inference. So the writer is given a context and a target label. So for example, entailing or neutral or contradictory. Then the writer generates a hypothesis and we give the hypothesis and the context to the model. We check the model's prediction, which we compare with the target label that the writer intended. We tell the writer what the what the model predicted, so we give direct feedback, and then we check whether the model was right or wrong. So if the model is right, okay, that's maybe a, a useful uh, training example, uh, but it's it's sort of less interesting because the model already knows uh, the, that the correct label for this example. But if the model is wrong, uh, then we can give it to another human or multiple other humans to see if they actually agree that the model was wrong and that the annotator was right. If there's disagreement, we throw these examples away. But if the verifiers also agree with the writer and with each other, then uh, we take these examples and they're very valuable. So we add them to the dev and test set of this round um, uh, to, uh, to measure how well models do. So what you can then do is you can train on this training data in addition to older training data, for example, on SNLI or multi-NLI, and then uh, see how well you do on this dev and test set. Uh, so obviously you'll improve which gives you a new model, which you can put back into the loop. So the idea here is that you get this cyclical uh, progress, if you will, um, where we keep getting better and better models uh, that learn from the examples where they fail uh, currently. So the hope here is that maybe you, you get higher quality training data as well, uh, because you get examples that are close to the decision boundary, and this will help you make faster progress. Um, but there's a problem with this sort of data collection, uh, which is that you want to have backward compatibility. So as you keep going through this loop, you have this problem that uh, old models, you can't really easily evaluate them on new uh, rounds of data collection. Um, so one uh, elegant solution to this problem is to uh, switch to an evaluation cloud where we have all of the models that uh, people uh, tested on these different rounds um, in the cloud, and we can uh, have this backward compatibility uh, that I talked about already, where we uh, can uh, go back in time essentially and, and uh, try out these old models on new data sets. Uh, so we, we can address a couple of interesting uh, problems here that exist with current benchmarks. So uh, rather than looking at this static uh, test set performance, we can uh, put models in the loop and then record their validated model error rate. So that's uh, 
uh, very similar to uh, like so validated means that is verified by people uh, to be correct and it's the model error rate so how many examples does the model get wrong the better the model is the harder it is to fool the model uh, so that is is reflected in the model error rate um, because we now have the models in this evaluation cloud we can also evaluate them along multiple axes so we can check for things like efficiency or memory usage but also for things like fairness and robustness uh, so we do this uh, through perturbations in the data and uh, so we measure things like do the systems work just as well if we replace james with jamal uh, or if we uh, change the gender of a sentence for example so uh, this gives us a fairness metric which obviously is very important uh, to have in these systems if you uh, want to deploy them in the wild um, so the task owners they choose what metrics they want to use what data sets they want to evaluate on and how they want to aggregate results uh, so they can take a, a, a long list of um, of data sets that they want to evaluate on. Some of these will be on the leaderboard, others will be just on the model evaluation page. Um, and this is really at their discretion. And then when new state-of-the-art models uh, come into existence, they can be put in the loop for new rounds of data collection. And the nice thing is we can still evaluate the old models too. Uh, so so uh, we can evaluate, in a sense, we also have forward compatibility. Uh, where we evaluate old models on new data and new models on old data. Um, so all of this stuff gives us dynamic leaderboards where we can uh, uh, think about the utility of a model. So we, if we have something like Diberda, maybe we care more about its performance on uh, a few of the data sets and not on all of them. Uh, so uh, we have these weights that you can apply to data sets. We also have weights that you can apply to the metrics here. So if you care more about accuracy and less about throughput, you can manipulate this, this in a dynamic leaderboard that allows you to specify your own utility function rather than having someone else determine for you what you should care about. Uh, so so uh, this really is another example of trying to make things as dynamic as possible. So with the project, uh, what we've done so far, we've created some uh, large scale, very interesting data sets. Things like Dynascent in Sentiment, uh, Hate Speech uh, uh, data set, uh, Adversarial Visual Question Answering. We've published a whole bunch of papers with a whole bunch more in the pipeline. Uh, there's a few at ACL actually that uh, could be interesting to you if you want to check them out. Uh, uh, so they've already happened by the time you're looking at this talk probably, um, but they, you can still go back and look at them. Uh, we've enabled some very interesting challenges. So the Flores 101 uh, shared task at WNT on large scale multilingual machine translation completely runs in the, the dynamic evaluation cloud uh, that exists for Dynabench. So that's very cool. And we've collected hundreds of thousands of raw examples that led to all of these data sets and uh, we're collecting a lot more. Uh, so we're making very good progress with the platform. And I thought I would uh, give you a quick demonstration of uh, what the platform looks like. Uh, so we have uh, a couple of different tasks. So let's say we care about sentiment analysis. We can see the dynamic leaderboard here. We can say like, specify what sort of metrics we care about, which as you can see, changes the ranking. Um, and we can create examples. So let's say we want to uh, do a positive statement that fools the model and we're uh, reviewing a restaurant, we could write something like, this restaurant used to be terrible, but now it's uh, not too bad. Something like this. So we give this to the model. Uh, the model, uh, to, unfortunately, the model was not fooled uh, because it actually correctly predicted uh, the label here. Um, so you can keep going. You can uh, try this for yourself. Please check it out and go to diningbench.org. Uh, there's a bunch of different models you can talk to also from different rounds uh, and for a bunch of different tasks. So for question answering, you would be selecting answers here and trying to come up with questions uh, that will fool the model, hopefully. Um, so that's the basic idea. Um, and um, so as I said, this really is a, a research platform um, and there are lots of very interesting research questions that still are not answered uh, around this platform. So th these are things that you've probably been thinking about when you were watching this talk, uh, which are like, how do you deal with distributional sh shift here? So because you have these models in the loop, you're sort of, uh, there's a selection bias uh, coming from the model. Uh, so how do you deal with that? And so um, uh, obviously that's a very valid question and that's uh, one we need to 
uh, look into. But the, the crucial thing here is that we should try to move beyond IID average case examples towards out of domain generalization, which is one of the characteristics that language is supposed to get you uh, when you believe in compositionality and strong generalization. Um, so we need to think a bit about what this actually means for language and if this is actually what we care about. So for some people, maybe it's not that's not the case, but at least this is what I am interested in as an NLP researcher. Um, and uh, so another question is the data that comes out of this, how useful is it for training purposes? The answer so far seems to be that it really depends. So maybe we can find better ways to really uh, use the, the training data in the right way. Can we come up with better metrics? So I mentioned things like fairness and, and currently the metric for this is pretty rudimentary. Um, and so it would be great if we can come up with better ways of measuring uh, important things like fairness and robustness. Um, and finally, there are questions uh, around how do we empower annotators using models in the loop? So can we make annotators more efficient um, and can we make ourselves more sample efficient uh, by, by giving annotators the right tools based on machine learning uh, so that we can make faster progress? So in conclusion, uh, if we want to deploy NLP models in the wild, they should work beyond the average case. Uh, we can use things like the validated model error rate to assess how good models really are when you deploy them in the wild. So how easy is it for me to mess with this model? Um, the process can be repeated over many rounds, uh, yielding useful training data in the process. Uh, the platform, because of its um, evaluation cloud, makes it easy to move beyond accuracy towards a much more holistic approach, which I think uh, is crucial for us to keep making progress uh, because we just need to have better measurements of what these models are doing. Um, and uh, one way to think of this is we're doing continuous testing of models in the worst case. Uh, and so this test set uh, that you would normally test on is a known unknown, but in this case, we also care about the unknown unknowns. Uh, so uh, we are trying to make all the things dynamic and hopefully uh, uh, succeed uh, at least partially in having the community rethink some of the crucial assumptions that underlie uh, the current benchmarking paradigm and hopefully will help us as a community make faster progress. Uh, so yeah, I should stress that uh, we would really love your help. Uh, this is a community effort, uh, so it's paid for by certain industry uh, uh, companies, uh, but the idea really is to make this a community project uh, where everyone who wants to uh, can join in. Um, so uh, if, if you're interested in this, please come up with model fooling examples, contribute new models, add new features, add new metrics, help improve the code base, start a new task. Uh, there, there's a lot to be done and a lot of interesting research questions to be asked and answered. We're also hiring, so please reach out if you're interested in this. And thank you very much for listening.